Okay, we're going to get started. This is Pam Shalou. I'm the COO of Bali, and I want to welcome everyone to um, this webinar featuring Judy Wicks. And before we uh, jump right into this exciting conversation, we have a couple of announcements from Mikael from here on the team. So Mikael? Hello, my name is Mikael Davila, and I serve as the Spreading Solutions Associate at Bali. And for today's webinar, we're going to have over 70 local economic leaders from across North America, and we're delighted to have you with us. I'm going to review a bit of housekeeping and provide a few reminders about this webinar series and then introduce our um, topic and speakers for today. So for some housekeeping, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you're dialed in by phone but have not joined us in the webinar room, please find a link in your reminder email from our registration system, um, iLink and that link will get you into the webinar room as well as have any um, dial-in information that you need. Because of the number of uh, webinar participants, we have the phone line muted, so our presenters will be the only ones being able to be heard. If you have a question for our presenter at any time during the webinar, please type your question into the public chat window. We will hold most of our questions to the end of the webinar when we will have time set aside for moderated Q&A. If you have any technical difficulties at any point during the webinar, please note this in the chat window, and I will send you a private chat to help you get sorted out. The private chat will show up as a new tab to the right of the public chat window in the top right corner of your screen, which will flash red once the private chat has been initiated. After each webinar, we'll email all attendees and registrants a link to the full recording of the webinar, along with the presentation slides and a copy of the questions from the chat. Please watch for these and all these materials in an email from me over the next couple days. So with that, if you have any other technical questions, again, you can chat me on the right-hand side, and I will start a private chat. Um, and I'll turn the control back over to Pam to uh, start the presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mikael. Uh, I just want to make a note that Judy uh, doesn't have Internet access this morning, so we're, we're going uh, we're, we're going to fly blind on this one as far as our slides are concerned, but uh, we think we have it all under control. Um, but uh, if we if you see any uh, bumps along the way, you'll know you'll know that we're we're working on it. So first, uh, to get started, I thought I would uh, welcome you by saying uh, Happy Earth Day. And I have a, a quote here from our speaker this morning uh, that she actually said uh, at our conference at the fifth annual Bali conference in Berkeley, California, in 2007. And I thought it was appropriate for us uh, today on this auspicious day. At its heart, our movement for local living economies is about love. It's the power of love that will help us overcome fear in the hard days ahead as we confront the effects of climate change and peak oil. Our love of place, our love of life, give us the courage to protect what we care about most, children, communities, animals, nature, all of life on our beautiful planet Earth. So we are so excited uh, today to have our um, co-founder and friend Judy Wicks here to talk um, a little bit about her new fantastic book and uh, the movement of local living economies as well as uh, Bali's upcoming conference which is happening in June in Buffalo, New York. Uh, so I wanted to take a moment to introduce Judy. For those of you who have not had the privilege of actually hearing her speak or uh, reading about her, uh, I'd like to let you know that she is an internationally known leader in the local economy movement. She's a businesswoman, an activist, an award recipient, actually numerous award recipients, uh, a mom, a restauranteur, and now an author. Her recent book, which is a memoir, Good Morning, Beautiful Business, The Unexpected Journey of an Activist, Entrepreneur, and Local Economy Pioneer, has already received much acclaim from some, you know, a few, a few people you may have heard of. Paul Hawken, Alice Waters, Van Jones, and Ben Cohen, to just name a few. Here at Bali, uh, we, we are affectionately call Judy the Bali Mama. And uh, with that, I thought I would uh, open it up and invite Judy to tell us a little bit about her inspiration in the founding of Bali and uh, what really motivated her to think about 
uh, catalyzing a movement like the one that we're currently all participating in. So good morning, Judy. <laughs> good morning, Pam, and good morning to everybody out there in Bali land. Uh, this is my first webinar, so I'm excited uh, to be with all of you today. Uh, so you should be looking at uh, slide one, which is um, the cover of my book. And um, it's a memoir that covers many chapters of my life that in different ways all lead to the conclusion uh, that we need to build a new global economy, one that's comprised of a network of uh, sustainable local economies, or as we call them, living economies. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the um, White Dog Cafe on the 3400 block of Sanson Street in Philadelphia. And I started that restaurant in 1983 and uh, ran it for 26 years, and it was really my teacher. Um, and uh, much of what I know and the conclusions I drew came from my work at the White Dog uh, in buying uh, from local farmers. Uh, was a very important uh, part of, um, of our business practices. Uh, the next slide, uh, slide three, uh, shows um, uh, uh, Judy and Mark Dornstreich, uh, they had Branch Creek Farm, and I learned uh, the importance of building self-reliant local food systems uh, through my work in Philadelphia, where I created um, a network of farms and restaurants, uh, beginning with the farms who supplied the, the White Dog Cafe. And I'll uh, read a, a passage uh, from the book that explains the name. Several years after I opened my restaurant, I hung a sign in my bedroom closet in my home above the White Dog Cafe, right where I would see it each morning. Good morning, beautiful business, it read, reminding me daily of just how beautiful business can be when we put our creativity, care, and energy into producing a product or service that our community needs. I was just beginning my journey. I didn't know then what I do now, that when you connect head and heart in business, you can transform not just business as usual, but the economy in general. You can find a way to make economic exchange one of the most meaningful, satisfying, and loving of human interactions. The sign would stay here for the next 15 years and would often make me think of my own business and how the farmers were already out in the fields harvesting fresh organic fruits and vegetables to bring into the restaurant that day. I would think of Judy Dornstrike picking rose geranium at Branch Creek Farm and how she once told me that when she picked it, she would imagine our pastry chef, James Barrett, making rose geranium pound cake for our dessert menu. I would think of the farm animals out in the pastures, pigs, cows, goats, chickens, enjoying each other's company in the fresh morning sun and, and uh, in the warm morning sun and fresh air. And I would think of Dougie Newbald, the goat herder, who claimed that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made their cheese better. And I think that's true. <laughs> Business, I learned, is about relationships. Money is simply a tool. What matters most are the relationships with everyone we buy from and sell to and work with and our relationship with earth itself. My business was the way I expressed my love of life, and that's what made it a thing of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go on to another uh, slide um, uh, of uh, Dr. Bill Elkin and his herd of black Angus uh, grass-fed uh, cows uh, that supplied the white dog. And then the next slide uh, is Dougie Newbald, uh, the one who likes to kiss her goat's ears. So um, another, while this was developing for me um, in Philadelphia in terms of uh, building this network of local farmers. I also began to work um, in uh, Chiapas, and uh, we'll look at slide number uh, six. Um, and I uh, learned from the uh, Zapatista Indians um, that um, I, w I was, I was um, I guess I was very curious to find out why the Zapatistas had their nonviolent uh, revolution on the day that NAFTA went into effect. So I, I went down to um, uh, Ch Chiapas to find out what was going on and ended up working with these coffee growers that you see in the picture and some um, small businesses from the states to uh, develop a, um, a fair trade organic uh, coffee export business that supported um, their revolution. Uh, we'll look at uh, the next slide. Uh, here's a picture of the Zapatistas. Uh, in this situation, they were signing our papers uh, to give us permission to come into the autonomous uh, indigenous held lands. Uh, so I learned from them um, something really important, and that is that their, their revolution was uh, about self-reliance, that uh, when NAFTA was enacted, it would not only lower the trade barriers so that um, cheap corn uh, that was subsidized by our, our uh, tax dollars through the farm bill 
um, was dumped into uh, Mexico, but it also NAFTA changed the Mexican constitution to allow indigenous lands that were collectively owned to be exploited by um, foreign corporations. So they could see, the Zapatistas could see the handwriting on the wall that um, they would lose their land, uh, that they'd go out of business with the, dump, the dumping of the cheap uh, subsidized corporate corn into their, into their communities. Uh, they wanted to have uh, local self-reliance. On uh, the next slide, on slide eight, uh, they wanted to have their own culture. Here are some of the women wearing their traditional dress. On the next slide, uh, they wanted to teach their children in their own language and, and, um, and in their own culture. On the next slide, uh, you'll see a young woman uh, weaving, and they, they made these traditional, beautiful uh, clothing. Um, what they did not want uh, is the next si slide, uh, number 11, um, of being forced to work in uh, the maquiladoras, the factories where uh, they worked for pennies to produce cheap clothing uh, to be exported uh, to the United States. Uh, the, the next slide, um, what happened when I was down in Chiapas um, working with the indigenous people, it occurred to me that um, I could see the relationship between the corn uh, farmers, or all the farmers really, in Chiapas and the farmers back home. And that's a picture of Glenn Brendel from a Green Meadow Farm picking, picking corn. That um, we, we were having the same fate, that the, the large corporations um, were driving our farmers uh, off the land as well. Um, and many farmers in the United States end up working on corporate uh, farms uh, and in the animal factories, um, and or driven off the the, in the off the, uh, the farmland altogether. Um, so I could see I drew the connection uh, between what was happening in um, uh, Mexico uh, to what was happening in the United States, and seeing that uh, the cry of the Zapatistas for local self-reliance was really uh, the call uh, from communities all over the world who were losing um, our, our local self-reliance and becoming dependent on long-distance corporate trade routes uh, to bring us our basic needs, uh, such as food and clothing and energy. On the next slide, you'll see our, uh, a group of business people, Hal Tausik, um, some of you may know, um, who um, came with me to Chiapas, and he and I um, pre-financed the, the uh, first shipment, when, first and second shipment, actually, of coffee, where we each put in $20,000 as a loan to pre-finance the harvest, and we did that for two years. And then after that, the community was able to pre-finance their own harvest and sent um, uh, ship co coffee, uh, 15 containers a year, uh, to the United States and, um, and Europe. I'll read one more, uh, another excerpt. Some might think that such a small coffee enterprise could not be significant, but the idea of connecting many small businesses together can become a powerful force. We had connected a network of communities working for self-reliance in the highlands of Chiapas with our network of small businesses building local self-reliance across the United States. It is this alignment of values, this connection of multiple networks of small producers and businesses that has the power to change the world. From my experience in Chiapas and with small farmers at home, I began to envision an alternative to the corporate-based global economy, an economic system that was locally self-reliant in basic needs and interconnected globally by an intricate network of small-scale business relationships that were win-win and supportive rather than exploitive of the local communities where products originated. I saw a way out of the current form of globalization and the ruin it brought. Mm -hmm. So um, next slide, uh, slide 14. Two events happened in the fall of uh, 1999 that um, inspired me to work nationally um, to um, begin a, um, a localization movement across the states. And the first one was uh, the Battle of Seattle. And here you see the protesters uh, in Seattle protesting against the World Trade Association. Uh, there were environmentalists and professors and students and labor le leaders. Uh, everyone protesting against the corporate control global economy. But there was no one articulating an alternative vision of what our economy could be. Uh, and I saw all these young people using their energy to protest what they didn't want, and I thought, we need a new vision uh, to turn this energy towards building something new. Then uh, days after Seattle, next slide, I learned the news that Ben & Jerry's uh, was going to be sold to a multinational. 
And this was a real wake-up call because Ben & Jerry's had been um, the leader of our socially responsible business movement for many years. It was uh, Ben & Jerry's that came up with the concept of the multiple bottom line to measure success not just by profit. Uh, it was Ben & Jerry's uh, where I learned about the living wage and alternative sourcing and so many other things. So I still remember when it finally just sunk in um, to me exactly what this was all about. I sat up in bed in the middle of the night and thought, my God, they've got Jen Ben & Jerry's. Um, so then, uh, next slide, it wasn't long before um, I realized other uh, responsible companies that have been leaders in our movement had also either sold or soon would be selling uh, to other multinational corporations, Douala to Coca-Cola, Honest Tea also to Coca-Cola, Stonyfield to Group Danone, the, the makers of Dan and Yogurt, uh, the Body Shop to L'Oreal, Tom's of Maine to Colgate Palmolive. Uh, and I realized that the movement for social um, responsible business, with, is, even though we were making great progress in some ways and spreading the idea of the multiple bottom line of people, planet, and profit, uh, that things weren't getting any better. Uh, our our um, environment was deteriorating, uh, inequality was increasing, uh, our political um, situation has, uh, uh, is, is threatening our democracy and having so much control and, uh, of wealth in our political uh, system. So I, I realized that um, the, uh, the socially responsible business movement was using the old paradigm to measure success, and that's uh, continual growth. And we were uh, continual material growth. And we were at the same time neglecting three important issues uh, that I saw. Uh, one, human scale, uh, that uh, how could we keep our businesses at a scale that was uh, conducive to maximizing relationships and, and greater happiness? Uh, we were neglecting place, uh, that national brands had no uh, connection to people or a particular place, and our streets were getting lined with uh, chain stores, the same that you see everywhere. And we were neglecting the issue of ho ownership, uh, perhaps the most important issue, uh, because we were creating fewer and fewer owners rather than more and more owners. And to ever have a just economy, we need to have many owners. Uh, the more owners we have, uh, the more freedom we have, the more equality we have, uh, the more justice. Uh, so we were going in the wrong direction. So um, slide 17. In 2001, I uh, co-founded uh, with Laurie Hamill uh, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And uh, we began networks in our own hometowns, Laurie in Boston. I started, I started the uh, Sustainable Business Network in Philadelphia. Uh, Laurie and I were the first co-chairs of the board, and we uh, hired our first co-directors, Michelle and Derek Long. And they started um, a network in, in Bellingham, Washington. Um, so we we're off and running. I'll read another excerpt. The audacious idea that a network of local living economies will eventually replace the unsustainable corporate controlled global economy takes a lot to imagine. But that's exactly what we localists believe. We're out to create a global system of human scale, interconnected local living economies that provide basic needs to all the world's people. Yes, we want them to function in harmony with local ecosystems and support just and democratic societies. But we also want the people who live in them to have joy in their lives. To put it simply, we believe in happiness. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Um, you know, I, I've been rereading your book, and uh, I would recommend to anyone who is uh, thinking about it and who hasn't already started to not read it right before bed because it keeps me up thinking about all the things that we still need to do <laughs> um, <laughs> and that there's uh, so much work uh, still left to do. But many lessons illustrated in your book. There are, your, your book actually is a handbook for socially conscious entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering, with all of the things that you've learned uh, through this work, if you could share with us um, what you think the three most important lessons are that you've learned over the years. Well, I think that the three most important and the ones that I um, clearly discuss in the book and, and have stories around um, are one, um, that we need to make decisions uh, from the heart as well as from the head um, and basically have a balance uh, between masculine and feminine qualities um, in our lives and in our businesses. And by that I don't mean um, a gender, but I mean the, the masculine and qualities inherent in both men and women, um, that it's become unbalanced and we make uh, too many decisions from the head and not from the heart. 
Um, a second lesson was around reinventing growth, that the old paradigm was about maximizing material growth. And I started looking at ways that we could grow in more healthy ways, uh, including non-material ways. And, I, and the third is, uh, um, is moving from competition to cooperation, that if we're going to build a new economy, that we need to cooperate. And uh, all three of these I go into in depth in my book, but I'll, I'll just take one of them, uh, making decisions from the heart, and uh, talk a little bit on this um, call about that. So let's go to the next slide. That's uh, number 18. Um, so um, one of the things about community-based businesses is that we see as business owners every day the people affected by our business decisions, whether they be our customers, our employees, our neighbors, um, our man-made environment in our towns and cities, or our natural environment. So we are more likely uh, to make decisions from the heart as well as from the head uh, because of these personal relationships. And I'll, I'll tell you three, three stories about this um, and how it affected as examples of, of my own business. I had heard about climate change. In fact, we started having programs at the White Dog in 1998 about climate change. And uh, Phil, uh, Pennsylvania was deregulated along with California uh, before other states were so we could buy renewable energy. Um, I think that was around in 19. 99 or so, but I hadn't been motivated to buy um, renewable energy until there was a drought in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And when I went into the woods that I love and saw that the woods was in distress, that the creek was all dried up, that the ferns were all crumpled up like brown tissue paper on the floor of the forest, and as I walked along, there was just an eerie silence. Not even the birds were singing. And I finally got it. I felt the stress of the woods, and I realized what climate change was going to be like, that parts of the world were going to have droughts and fires. I could just feel the um, the fear of fire in the air during this drought in the woods. And other parts of the, of the world would have uh, storms and floods. Um, and of course, that's, that's what has happened since 1999 when I first realized this. So I just went over to a big um, uh, tree, um, a big oak tree, and became a tree hugger. And I kissed, <laughs> kissed and hugged that tree. <laughs> and I uh, promised that I would go back to Philadelphia and sign up for renewable energy. And the White Dog became the first business in Pennsylvania to buy 100% of our electricity from uh, renewable sources. But that was because I was able to connect my head and heart uh, and be motivated uh, to do what I knew was right. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, on the uh, right side is a uh, dishwasher from the right dog, uh, White Dog, uh, Greg Coleman. And, and uh, he went on one of our trips to our, we had a sister restaurant program, international sister restaurant program, and this is him with a dishwasher in our Cuban sister restaurant. And the two dishwashers got together, and he was very thrilled to see what a cute dishwasher they had at the sister restaurant <laughs> in uh, Havana. Um, but anyway, um, my second story is about uh, paying a living wage. And I heard about paying a living wage. In fact, I heard it uh, from Ben and Jerry's at a conference, and which is a, a volunteer commitment on the part of a um, business owner to pay the living wage, um, what it takes to live in a certain community rather than the minimum wage. And so when I first heard about this, I thought, well, that works on other companies, but not restaurants. We have too many entry-level dishwashers and prep people and whatnot. But one day I was in the kitchen, and I happened to look up, just as Greg and two other dishwashers who were uh, peeling potatoes or putting dishes away, they, all three looked up at me at the same time. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went off, off in my head. And I thought, what am I thinking? Of course I want Greg and Jack and... Joe to make a living wage. Uh, of course I want them, if they work full-time at the White Dog, to be able to pay their rent and buy their clothes and food. So I uh, began um, a program to get everybody up to, at that time it was $8 an hour was a living wage. Um, and so then we started having every, every time someone was hired, their entry-level um, wage was $8. Uh, next slide. Um, another story um, came when I was stopped at a red light in front of a um, public high school near my restaurant and watching the children come out of the high school and thinking that this was the school that my kids would go to if I didn't send them to private Quaker schools. Yet I knew nothing about the school and the students who went there. So we started a mentoring program and had uh, kids from the high school come to work in the White Dog um, to learn the restaurant business. I'll read another excerpt. In each of these examples, paying a living wage, signing up for renewable energy, and starting a mentoring program, I was motivated to make positive decisions by connecting with my heart. Having firsthand real life experience with people and places in my own community helped me to do that, but it was not the only factor. After all, there are plenty of examples of acting locally with a closed heart 
and on the other hand, making compassionate decisions that affect people and places far away. It's really about that journey Jung spoke of, the one from the head to the heart. In the business world, that's often a difficult journey. So many messages tell us, don't be a softy. Success comes by keeping a stiff upper lip. This is a lesson boys are traditionally taught from a young age and women adopt in order to compete successfully in business. As a child growing up in the 1950s, before the time when girls were directed toward careers outside the home, I had refused to participate in doll playing, cooking, and sewing, which was meant to prepare girls for a life of service as mothers and wives. A life of service while the guys get to do all the cool stuff? No way. But now as an adult, I found myself embracing the feminine qualities I had once rejected, the qualities of the heart actually making them part of my business philosophy and even my definition of the very purpose of business. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of the stories from my book. Um, I I hope you'll read it. There's many, many more. And and, uh, it's true, Judy, that you're going to be uh, at our conference in uh, in June and that you'll have uh, an opportunity, people would have the opportunity to hear more about the lessons there and and get a chance to, to um, talk to you more about your book as well. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I'll be doing a, a plenary session as well as a breakout. And I'll be talking about uh, some of those other lessons that I didn't get to on this call. Mm-hmm. Awesome. When, when, when you first initiated uh, the founding of Bali and uh, uh, thought about the importance of convening folks together, um, the idea and, and notion of having a conference was really important. And so I thought um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about why you feel it's so important to bring localists together and, and what they might uh, expect at our uh, upcoming conference. Okay. Uh, well, let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, I love this picture. This is a, um, was taken at last year's conference in Grand Rapids. And every year we have what we call the back of, a, of the napkin business plan contest. And these are the uh, four women that won the contest last year uh, holding up their napkin with a business plan on the back. <laughs> um, and uh, we had our, our, our first conference um, in 2002 in Portland, Oregon. And it's really the most exciting time of the year uh, for the Bali uh, conference and it, uh, for the Bali community. And it's really the time when we have the best opportunity to advance our goals of uh, connecting leaders and spreading um, solutions and models. And one of the things that makes, it, makes Bali different from other business conferences is that unlike national brands, our community-based businesses don't face the, the fierce competition um, among the brands. Um, and instead, we're, we're really eager to sh- uh, share our ideas and our solutions uh, with businesses around the country. So if we have a successful food processing business in Philadelphia, for instance, we're eager to, sh- uh, to share that successful model with a processing business in Chicago or San Francisco. We're not competing with each other. So it's all about uh, sharing. It's all about um, cooperating, and there's a real excitement and a real buzz to the Bali conferences that you often don't uh, find in other conferences because we're just so excited about sharing what works. Um, and you know, the, the, not just about uh, among the entrepreneurs. I think that the largest part of the conference, uh, the largest segment, I, I see there's a sort of four segments of people who come to the conference, and probably the largest one are the entrepreneurs, but not quite half. Um, and um, it's, so it's really important for network leaders to um, make sure the word is spread among all the entrepreneurs in town to give them the opportunity to come to the Bali conference because it's really great for entrepreneurs. But the other a largest section of people who come are the nonprofit leaders, uh, the network leaders uh, who are members of Bali and also nonprofit leaders who might be in local food system work or green building work and so on, uh, who also are sharing um, the, the, the um, best solutions that they have in building local economies uh, through their nonprofit work. And then uh, a small uh, but growing group and an important group are local government leaders. And I see this as very, very important because it's very hard to make progress in building local economies with a local government that's working against us. And as we know, many local governments think that the, 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 um, the way to have economic prosperity is for some large corporation you know, to move into town and, and uh, provide lots of jobs uh, competing with our locally owned businesses at times and giving those big companies um, tax breaks and subsidies and and whatnot to locate in our towns. 
So uh, we've been making some headway, our movement for local economies, in reaching these government leaders and showing them how, how important it is to um, to invest in our locally owned businesses. That that's what really builds community wealth um, through locally owned um, businesses, and the, to pull that economic power back to our local economies and communities from those faraway boardrooms. And so it's very important to uh, get more. Uh, local government leaders uh, to come to our conferences, and I think it's an, it would be great for those of you out there who have relationships with local government to invite some of those leaders in the um, economic development departments or whatever uh, to come and meet with other local government leaders. And we always have uh, some uh, some um, speakers of uh, government leaders who are doing a great job of building local economies in their in their areas. And then another group that comes are. Um, uh, thought leaders and authors and activist citizens who uh, w want to learn and uh, spread ideas uh, about how um, we're growing local economies. And then there's always a, a handful of, um, of people who, attendees who come from other countries. Uh, we had someone come from France, um, I guess maybe about six years ago when R Raphael first came, and he, he came to several conferences and started a, a, a Bali-like a network in France and has recently written a book about it in, in French. <laughs> so it's very interesting to see how that's developed. And we've had people come from Japan and Australia and Sweden and so on. So there's always a little bit of an international influence. And we see this movement is really a, a global one, uh, ultimately, that there's local economy work being done all over the world. Um, and some of us have spoken. I did a 10-day um, speaking tour in Australia a few years back, and Michael Sh Schumann has gone down there. So there's, there's things happening all over the world. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about the conference is finding others you know, who have the same vision. They're working towards the same vision. And oftentimes you know, in our, uh, our communities, we feel, those of us who are leaders in this work, we feel a little isolated. Um, and uh, it's just so exciting to go to the conference and connect with people who are doing the same type of work in their, their own communities. And so it's not so daunting anymore when we connect to leaders from other communities and to really see how we're part of um, a national, even uh, global, global movement. It's very exhilarating. Um, I'll, um, I'll read you one more uh, passage here that I have in my book about the conferences. Bali conferences are gatherings we look forward to all year a place to connect with other local economy leaders, share our stories and strategies, learn about positive solutions, eat lots of local food, drink the local beer, dance to local musicians, and come away inspired and eager to get home and try out new ideas. Hosted by a local business network in a different part of the country each year, the conference includes tours of real-life examples of a local living economy in the making, with visits to local factories producing such things as porous paving blocks made from recycled materials, or an independent retailer selling locally designed and made clothes, or projects by the local municipality, such as a city-run compost program, or solar housing development for seniors. Whatever that community has to offer is a successful local living economy model to share with visitors. Each year I think to myself, this would be a great place to live, though I always make it back home to Philly. Mm -hmm. So I'll um, just go on to the last slide. Um, that's a, a slide of our local Bali network, the Sustainable Business Network. Um, some of you might know uh, Marianne Fuller, uh, who now goes by her married name, um, Borgeson. Uh, she was the first director of our local network and then went to work for Bali National and then went on the board of Bali, was the board, Bali chair for a while, <laughs> and now is, uh, is doing some consulting work for, for Bali. Um, but anyway, there we all are um, uh, dancing in the wiki wacky woods. Uh, when we were starting up our local Bali network, and I think that's uh, you know the most the the most um, fun thing really about being a local network and coming to the Bali conference is that there's there's really a collective joy uh, in working toward a shared vision you know for our community and for our country and for our world um, a shared vision for um, local living economies. So more than anything, I think it brings happiness um, and fun. And that's why I like to go to the conferences. And I hope you all will, will join us um, okay. in Buffalo uh, in June. So I think we're ready for questions, right, Pam? 
We are. We are. Um, I just wanted to um, just do a, a quick plug to let people know that the conference is June 12th through 14th. Uh, in Buffalo, New York, and today uh, you have until midnight to take advantage of the early bird registration. So if you go to our website at BeALocalist.org, you can uh, register for our conference and um, come and participate at uh, one of the best uh, parties that celebrates local economies um, in the world and, and hear more from Judy. So I've been scanning some of the questions that are coming in, Judy, and one of the ones, there's, there's one that um, is, is evolving uh, around uh, what I would say community capital and different sources of capital for small businesses. One person asked about antidotes, for, antidotes from local businesses with alternative currencies, and then another around um, you know, how, how do you as an individual uh, non-licensed investor uh, help to do some investing in small businesses in, in your economy to make change? So what are some of the models that you've seen over the years um, that you, or you see emerging that are helping to uh, support local businesses in, in the, in, um, across the nation? Yeah. Well, um, of course, driving capital is, is, is the third goal of of, uh, of Bali and uh, uh, an important one. And we, we do have a, a full day uh, community capital um, forum on the day before the conference starts. But um, I'll just tell you some of my own um, experiences in this. Uh, I, in 1999, I, uh, my, uh, my mother passed away. My father had already passed and I inherited stock. And I never had stock in my life and um, I wasn't sure quite what to do with it. And first I I heard about socially responsible investing and, and uh, found a broker and switched my stocks to screen stocks uh, that uh, you know, eliminated um, you know, weapons and uh, animal testing and whatnot. But when I looked at my portfolio, I, I saw Walmart. And I, I couldn't have Walmart you know, in my portfolio. So it made me realize that I really didn't want to be invested in any publicly traded company, that I only wanted to, be, uh, to invest in uh, companies that were triple bottom line, and of course, publicly traded companies are require, required by law to to um, make decisions in the best financial interest of their of their stockholders, as opposed to the other stakeholders. So, um, so I sold all of my stock, and I put every penny um, into my local uh, community investment fund, which is called uh, the Reinvestment Fund, uh, trfund.org. If anybody's in my region, I think they now um, are in Pennsylvania. New Jersey and Maryland, but all the money is invested uh, locally. Um, and uh, I, I, I discovered that the wind turbines that the White Dog signed up for a renewable energy uh, from were actually capitalized by this fund. So that the money that I was investing was used to do things like start um, uh, to build wind turbines. And I, um, so I coined a term um, that when we invest locally, that we get a living return not just the um, fin uh, financial return, but a living return of living in a more sustainable, healthy, happy, thriving uh, community. Um, so um, I, I'm fortunate that in Pennsylvania or in Philadelphia, we, we have the reinvestment fund, which is 30 years old or more at this point, um, but many communities don't have that. Uh, I think you can look on, um, Cal under Calvert Community Funds, uh, and uh, at least they used to uh, have a function where you could put in your zip code and they'll let you know what community funds might exist in your particular geographic area. Uh, but there's also, uh, of course, community banks and credit unions and more and more uh, models uh, of um, uh, communities uh, taking this on themselves and forming investment clubs. Certainly the slow money movement um, is advancing this idea of people getting together and investing in their, in their local um, food system. Uh, and our, in Philadelphia, uh, we, we do have now a, a, a food analyst uh, at the reinvestment fund that looks into opportunities for investing in our local food system. So that part of um, where my money is is going to work for food as well. Um, so uh, um, you know, obviously these, these need to be local. So every community is different. Uh, at the Bali conference, we, we always do have different examples of what's working in, in other uh, communities, uh, even just people getting together. I always wanted to start an aunts and uncles club um, and just in, invite people. There's Usually you, you have friends that are interested in investing five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in a local business, but they don't know where to start. So that's a function that a local Bali network could really 
help to um, uh, help to do is to uh, have a session where people are invited to come uh, who might want to invest some money, and then uh, maybe three or four different local companies uh, do a presentation of what needs they have and what their business is like, and then people can just uh, self-organize and make their own investments uh, where they want. It's just as simple as that. Um, and that's, you know, at Slow Money, they do something similar where they have uh, entrepreneurs invest, um, and, and then people uh, uh, can meet with them and make the investment on their own. So there's many different, um, many, many different ways. I'm not an expert in this particular area, but there are people, and of course there's um, the RSF social finance, uh, where if you don't have a way to invest in your own community, if you invest at RSF social finance, uh, they invest in um, businesses all, uh, all over the country um, that are building local economies, and they also invest in things like Walter Schools and uh, Camp Hills and um, uh, planned communities and that kind of thing. So that's another way that those who don't have a local vehicle can d uh, make sure that their money is doing good in our country. Uh, but uh, like I say, there's, uh, there are, are many other examples of what local economies are doing. Uh, I just don't uh, know offhand, but that's another thing you can find out at the, at the conference. Great. And I think we also have, don't we have a, a whole series of uh, community capital uh, webinars, webinars. Uh, Pam? We do. We absolutely do. And um, th that's all available on our, on our website at BeALocalist.org under our Spreading Solutions pillar of work that we do. So I would encourage uh, anyone who's interested in uh, some of the alternative community or, or uh, community capital work to check out the series. Um, uh, all of the uh, past webinars are available there as well. Um, so we have another question, Judy, uh, around uh, citizen activism and uh, how do you actually, uh, as a small business entrepreneur, what, what advice would you give around um, uh, doing activist work to change some of the policies that are in place that, that stop us from having um, triple bottom line businesses? Well, I think that's really important. I, you know, I, I used to, when I was very young and first getting into business, I, I had a traditional perspective where, you know, you work nine to five, um, five days a week to earn your money, and and then the other things you care about around social change or activism, uh, you do those things on uh, in the evenings and the weekends. Uh, but once I got into the restaurant business, I I realized that there there was no downtime um, in the restaurant business. We're open every night and we're open every weekend and so for time management reasons, I uh, began to uh, uh, do my activist work through my business. Um, and so anytime I had an issue that I wanted to address, I would have a program on it at the White Dog um, and uh, take people on tours, you know, f affordable housing tours or uh, child watch tours to look at the lives of inner city kids or have speakers on the drug war or foreign policy or whatever. So I kind of incorporated into my business um, the, the various um, um, you know, issues that I wanted to address. And education really became uh, a service of the White Dog Cafe. And I, I remember hearing Willis Harmon from the World Business Academy say one time um, about how he felt that eventually all businesses uh, would have education as a service. And I, 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 think that's, uh, I think that's true, that there's so many ways that we as Bali business people can educate our employees and our customers about the issues of the day, whether they're local ordinances that need to be passed or foreign policy, national foreign policy that needs to be changed. There's just um, so many different issues that we need to address. And oftentimes, um, Businesses have uh, gathering places. Of course, the restaurant was very convenient <laughs> because I could serve a meal and so on. But other types of businesses also, bookstores um, and, and various retail stores often have space where customers can gather to discuss the issues. And um, business people have clout uh, to uh, take on issues. I know some uh, local Bali networks are more uh, politically active than others, but certainly when you band together and take a position on something, um, you have a lot more clout uh, than like an average, the average citizen. Uh, a because you're a business person, and B because um, you've joined in, together, you know, a group of business people that are all um, uh, aligned around a, a certain issue. 
and I, and I think that when this begins to happen, that um, local government will see you as a go-to person if they're looking for a speaker on um, you know various progressive um, local politicians are looking for a business speaker on a certain issue that they'll call you. Uh, that certainly has happened at, uh, at a sustainable business network in Philadelphia. Uh, Leanne kruger Brianicki had a great, uh, as our director, had a great relationship with local government. She's now left after eight years and works for Bali. <laughs> and we have a, a, a new a director, uh, Jamie, who's terrific. But anyway, um, we, SBM became the go-to place for local politicians looking for um, business people to support uh, a certain um, issue. So I, I think it's really um, uh, an opportunity um, when we have a group of businesses to, um, to organize, uh, to, to bring a, a, a about the, the legislation that we actually need in order to grow uh, local living economies. Right, right. Beautiful. Um, so we talked a lot about at Bali, uh, small business leaders, and uh, you, you referenced some of the, the groups that um, people who show up at our conference and are part of the community. What, what, what do you think the average person can do to help build localism in their communities? What, what are some of the practical, easy things that people can do to further the localist movement? Well, you know, I'd say the, the first thing is to support local businesses, you know, to buy local, to think local first, as we say in Bali. Um, and that's not just the retailers, although that's the front line of supporting the local coffee shop instead of the Starbucks and supporting the local pharmacist instead of the, the thrift drug and so on and the CVSs. Um, when we have them, when they haven't already been driven out of business, and supporting the local hardware stores and um, one of the things that I find interesting are these uh, crowd uh, crowdsourcing. Or, uh, is that what it's called? Where um, it's, it's more the younger generation has come up with this. Where they, um, I remember one time Michelle talking about a, a business in Bellingham, uh, a natural food store that was having problems and was uh, really it was a threat that they might go out of business. And so the local community got together and they they and including the other other natural food stores and sent people to that business on a certain day. They said, everybody go and shop there. So they were just flooded with more business that day, um, and even their competitors sent them business. And their employees you know, worked for free you know, that day and so on. Um, so I think that is just such a really cool thing. I just heard recently that there's a struggling pharmacy in, in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, I, w I was thinking that it would be, uh, be fun to organize something like that you know, to support that pharmacy. Uh, but um, the, our spending dollar has a lot of power, uh, especially when we, we organize um, to uh, do it as a group. Um, and then, of course, um, local investing, as we, we did talk about the importance of local um, capital uh, being available. So I think it's important to look to see um, uh, what, what options you have for banking, uh, not just long-term investments, but banking. Are you banking in a a local bank or a local uh, credit union where that money is then invested in our, in our own communities. Um, so that's really important um, as well. Um, you know, and I think uh, just, the, just the spirit of community of, um, I mean, one of the things I, I, I do is I, I, I and maybe it's because I'm such a party person, but I love to plan events. And so even though now I'm retired from the restaurant business, I sold the White Dog four years ago, I still uh, plan parties for my community. I, I moved to a new community, and uh, so we, 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 you know, we, I got together with some of my neighbors and um, started a, a couple traditions uh, for parties, uh, my all-women wine and cheese party and my uh, <laughs> Bastille Day picnic <laughs> down by the river and our geezers rock the square party where we took over a local square that's usually um, monopolized by children and have uh, for a night where over six, those over 60 uh, play all these <laughs> songs from the 60s and dance in her, her summer of love clothes. So I think just having a, a community festivities to build a sense of community, to know who your neighbors are, um, because it's really, I think local economies are really uh, about, uh, about community, uh, not knowing the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, but also your, you know, your neighbors. Um, and I think and in any way that we, we build community and a sense of fun, a sense of place, and that we don't have to go far away uh, to have a good time. We don't have to spend carbons and 
dollars uh, going to exotic places for our vacations. We can create fun in our own community with it, with our with our neighbors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I I'd like to go to the geezers party. That sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to be over sixty um, though. <laughs> and, uh, we, were, we were thinking that we would start carding people and say, you'll be carded. You must have your Medicare card to prove that you're, <laughs> you're over 65. <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, in your book and in just in conversations with you, you've talked a lot about how it was a childhood dream to actually write a book, and now, and now you have one, and it's out. And I wonder if there's, uh, in, in writing your memoir, um, if you have any special moments uh, through the process that uh, sort of uh, come come to life in, in creating the book that uh, you'd like to share with us. Oh, gee, there are, there are a number of things. I'm so glad um, that I that I wrote it. Um, you know, I started writing it 10 years ago, and uh, but I, I just was too busy. Not only did I have a business to run, but starting Bali and our local Bali network and so on, I was just overwhelmed and. But I did start to just write things down, and I'm glad because uh, I'm sure I wouldn't remember. Uh, you know, now I'm basically 66, and it's it's getting harder to remember these things. So I'm I'm so uh, glad that I started writing things down 10 years ago, and kept journals and of my trips and so on. And that was very very helpful. Um, but the, but I struggled a lot, um, and I I really didn't. Uh, I had a lot of starts and, and stops, and I, and I started to wonder whether I, could, I was capable of, of, of writing it because it was hard to get it organized. That was my biggest problem. How to, at the time, I, I wasn't sure that it was going to be a memoir. I was to, uh, trying to be fancy and have each chapter be a different principle of the local economy movement and then use different stories within the chapter to illustrate that. But then I'd get all bollocked up because I'd be talking about my children but realized I hadn't told the reader I was married. and. Um, and I thought, well, I'm just going to have to get a ghostwriter. I just can't do this. And I'm so glad that I didn't because I did learn um, from writing um, and started to connect the dots and some things in my life. Um, and, I, you know, the thing that um, I guess was most fascinating to me personally was this whole idea of um, bringing feminine energy into balance with the masculine. And, you know, I was sort of sensing that um, it, it, it had kind of crept into my speeches and whatnot, but it wasn't until I wrote, uh, wrote my book that I really started uh, connecting the dots through my whole life uh, from my childhood. Uh, you know, I start when I'm nine years old, building my forts up in the woods and so on, and seeing you know, how my um, behavior as a, um, a young person uh, was, was really, um, well, being a tomboy and being denied the opportunity to play softball um, was very upsetting to me, and so I was angry about this. And I, I really, I didn't want to be a girl. I wanted to uh, do the cool stuff like the boys did, and I get to play baseball. And I wanted to take shop instead of home ec. And, and so I uh, really uh, purposely tried not to do, uh, to show weakness. You know that I was tough and that I wasn't going to play with dolls or any of this kind of thing. And, and I remember one time um, picking on a kid. Um, and uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say I was a bully in any, any way, but uh, one day there was a, a boy about a year younger than me who I used to play with quite a lot on rainy days we'd play board games, and he, he probably was, was gay. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but he was a feminine, and, um, and I used to dress him up as a ballet dancer in our little plays that we put on in the locker room in the, in the uh, garage for my, my parents' I would invite all the mothers over to watch the play. So anyway, um, one day I just started um, picking on him and calling him a sissy and saying, why, why, why won't you fight me? Are you afraid of me? Um, and kind of picking on him. And he, he left and went home and never came back. And I, I realized in hindsight, as I was writing my book really, um, that, you know, that this was the key to uh, abuse. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go that far, but I could sense what it was like that when, um, that when we uh, abuse someone else that's weaker than us, um, whether it's animals or uh, our, our wife or children or whatever, that we actually are, um, we are, are fighting that um, sensitive soft spot within us. Like I was attacking my own femininity. I was attacking my own, um, uh, that part of me uh, by lashing out against this, this, this boy. Um, and so it, it was really um, 
eye-opening to really understand where abuse comes from. And it comes from, I feel, um, from re- repressing the feminine in each of us. Um, and that, um, you know, boys are taught to be tough, that you don't want to, you know, be a sissy. You don't want to have feelings. You don't want to. And so we repress that part of ourselves. Um, and it sometimes turns to, to actual violence and bullying um, towards others uh, to show that we're tough. And I, that was a kind of a light bulb went off in my head to really understand how important it is for us to uphold the feminine um, in each of us, in, in men and women both, that, that uh, we're, 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 we're made up of equally of, of the masculine and the feminine, and, and we need more feminine energy in our economy that, you know, that we've, uh, the, uh, and one of my farmers, um, he came up with a great analogy. He said that successful farming is the balance between the masculine and the feminine. And to him, the masculine was efficiency uh, and the feminine was nurturing. And that if you have um, too much efficiency in your farming, uh, you might have a good business, but you won't have good vegetables. But if you have too much nurturing, you might have great tomatoes, but you'll end up going out of business because you're not efficient with your time. And I saw that the factory farming of animals was just the, 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 the epitome of masculine um, energy going amok, that uh, it was all about efficiency of putting the animals, these chickens in the cages and the pigs in the crates and so on, was all about um, efficiency of, of bringing every la- little penny, you know, from the animals and from the workers, you know, from, you know, from life. Um, and this was all about efficiency and not, nothing about uh, nurturing. Um, and so, you know, that was my, I think, my biggest lesson um, and, and what I hope I got across in my book was the need to, uh, to bring more feminine energy uh, into our economy, more nurturing, more love, more heart-based uh, decisions, more compassion. Um, so, and that, I, I, really, I really got that um, from my own story and from writing my own story and seeing my own evolution from um, a girl who tr- tried to repress my feminine and to a woman who embraced it in my, in my business and actually made service um, and nurturing and caring and compassion a big part of, of, my, of my company. It, it, it really is remarkable, Judy. And in reading the book, you can just feel um, that sense of uh, aha and the, and the palpable nature of the infusion of the, the, of the feminine energy. And, as I was reading the book, I really saw it as a, you know, really a metaphor for our current economic system, and that the need for the nurturing and the feminine is 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 a is a calling. It's it's what Mother Earth is calling uh, today. Exactly, um, exactly. So it was, it's beautiful, and it, it was it's been a joy over the last uh, ten plus years to see your your story unfold and, and you blossom as a beautiful. Um, uh, woman w- fully embracing both sides of, of your power. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Pam. Um, uh, we, we're about, uh, we've got about two minutes left. I wanted to just note for people that if you wanted to know more about uh, Judy's book, you can um, check out, uh, she has a website, judywicks.com. You can certainly check out Bali's website at bealocalist.org. Um, and uh, Chelsea Green is the publisher of, of uh, Judy's book. Uh, so Judy, in the last minute you get the final word. Is there anything you'd like to leave, um, leave us with? Well, um, I hope to see you all in Buffalo for a lot of fun and uh, a lot of uh, meaning and learning. Um, and I hope you buy my book and that you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's phenomenal. Thank you so much, Judy, for your time this morning, for writing the book, for all that you're doing uh, to further local economies, and um, we look forward to being with you in Buffalo. Great. Thank you, Pam. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.